When I look at a gorgeous, large palm, outside or inside, I am immediately in that tropical feeling mode. The way that the sway in the wind, the way the leaves cascade over their delicate stems, palms just have that certain something when it comes to creating that jungle vibe in your home or on your property. So Palms are gorgeous to look at, but they're also notoriously tricky plants to successfully care for. As you'll find out in this episode in my conversation with Chris, I actually just said goodbye to a fan palm that I brought home with high hopes of achieving that jungle look, but instead, oof, real plant fail there. Just have the whole thing turn black within two months. But it's all part of the journey. It's part of the inspiration for this episode. I know a lot of people have struggled with palms in the past, and Chris gives us so much information. Speaking of the journey that we are all on together, I'm so happy to be here learning alongside you, plant friends. This week, we're learning about palm care on Blue Mangrove Radio. Plant friends. Friends, welcome back to Bloom and Grow Radio. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks as per usual. Special thanks to our newest Patreon supporters, Samantha, Susan, and Michael. So appreciative that these wonderful humans and all the Patreon plant friends, so thankful for these wonderful humans. Welcome to our community of Patreon plant friends supporting the show, helping me bring this show to as many planty ears around the world as possible. Speaking of community, by the time this episode airs, we will have either launched or we'll be in the process of launching our official community platform. It's amazing. It's so fun. And I want you to click the link in the show notes for more details to either hop on that wait list for the imminent launch that's coming or just hop on in the platform. The Patreon plant friends got early exclusive discounted access and have been hanging around, playing around in the platform for a while now. So, so excited to bring it to our larger community. Okay, palms. Lots of listeners and friends have sent requests for a palm episode because, man, they're beautiful plants, but they're super finicky. And I'm so excited to welcome back Chris Satch, who is such a beloved guest of the podcast for a deep dive on palm care. You might remember Chris. He's a super popular guest. He's been on many episodes of the show, including How to Water Your Plants, Plant Latin, Prepping Your Plants for Spring, Variegation 101, and even episode three of the show. Chris was one of the first people I interviewed for Bloom and Grow Radio, and he's really grown alongside me as the show has grown. And I've learned so much from him as a human, and he's a dear friend. So, so excited to have Chris back. He's known for his botanical deep dives, and he really doesn't disappoint. So without further ado, let's learn about palms. Welcome back to Bloom and Grow Radio, Chris. It's been too long. It has been, Maria. It's so good to be back. Wish that we were doing this in person, but it's still really nice to see you over a Zoom call. We're closing in on the final months of, of social distancing, but you just behind the scenes showed me your fancy new apartment you moved into. Tell the listeners about the insane window setup you've got in your new apartment. Well, I was very lucky and I searched around and, you know, with COVID and everything, you know, a lot of folks moved out of the city. So now there's a lot of apartments to choose from. So I got really lucky and I got an apartment that has uh, nearly floor to ceiling, south and west facing windows. It's a corner apartment. There's no obstruction. It's quite high. It's a 25th, 26th floor. And uh, yeah, I can see the river. I can see the Hudson River. So super lucky. I don't think I'll ever get this deal again. I don't think I'm leaving here. I I am green (laughs) with envy. Literally, you have unobscured, huge ass windows. You're living every New Yorker's dream. So, so thrilled for you. And I know that those listeners who have been growing alongside you with me for the last four years are probably as excited for you as I am, because I think all us plant people know a big window is just the dream. Nothing beats a big window. Absolutely (laughs) right. Yep, yep, yep. yep, Only a big plant. The only thing that beats a big window is like a big old monster leaf. That's true. That's true. That's true. So for those of you listening who might not know, Chris is a longtime friend of Blooming Girl Radio. It's been a minute since we've had you back on, but you were episode number three on Bloom and Grow. You were my third guest, one of my first interviews an amazing botanist and and friend of the show. And I am so excited to have you back on to talk about palms because I've personally just killed a palm this week, just composted my first attempt at palms. And I know that there's something our listener community struggles with. Yep, absolutely. And it's weird you say that because 
I've had a couple of clients call me. Sometimes I do uh, consultations and I've had some clients call me and they're saying, oh, my palm has died. My palm has died. And literally within the past three weeks, I have had more palm questions than any other questions. So there must be something to it. There must be something in the air right now about palm. So I'm super happy to talk about them and uh, clear the air in terms of palm care, where they come from, give you guys a little bit of palm interesting factoids, (laughs) history and uh, good stuff like that. I love it. And I think maybe having a better understanding of, as always, a better understanding of where plants come from outdoors and some hacks to take better care of them indoors. But, you know, I feel like they're a genus. Palm is a family. Where, how high up the food chain, where does a palm live? So all palms, as we know it, are in the palm family, Aricaceae. Okay. That being said, there are things that are called palms that are not actually palms. The word palm goes back a long time. And the word areca goes back a long time, which is where the plant family gets its name, Aricaceae. So in the old times, palm was just kind of a generic term tossed towards palm trees and sort of anything that had that fountain, floofy leafed kind of look that swayed in the wind. So you'll get certain cycads referred to as palms. They're cycads. They you know, to the untrained eye, they look just like short Mm -hmm. squat palms, but they're not palms at all. There's also things like the Madagascar palm, which is not a palm. I think it's a Pachypodium or Pacopodium. There are plenty of other plants that are referred to as palms that are not palms. But if we're talking about true palms, if we're talking about things that are not, you know, mislabeled with their common name, and I can go on and on about, you know, let's use a scientific name once in a while. Common names are great, but, you know, when you start calling everything a palm, it starts getting a little dicey. But mm-hmm. uh, with regards to true palms, they're all in the family Aricaceae. They're all related to one another. So, okay. Mm-hmm. So what are the most common, and let's use, I guess, common names and scientific names. What are the common palms that most people would know? Well, actually, mo- you know more palms than you think. I'll bet, I'll, I'll place a wager that you probably know at least four five to 10 palms and didn't even know it. Okay. I'll take that bet. (laughs) All right. Palm number one, the coconut palm, the palm that makes coconuts. That's a palm tree. Be like, oh, kind of like what everyone thinks of as a palm tree. Yep, exactly. So that's a palm tree. It makes coconuts. There's different kinds of coconuts. I'm sure Mm -hmm. uh, as folks have seen, there's green coconuts, there's brown coconuts. There's sort of like the more ovally shaped coconuts and there's super round coconuts. So a coconut palm is a palm. It's Cocos nucifera. So that's one palm. There's also date palms. If you've ever had dates, the fruit, they're very common in the Middle East uh, and in, you know, Africa. Dates are edible. The fruits are edible. So there's date palms. That's two. There's also this one might not be, you might not be as familiar with its name, but you've definitely eaten it. It's the Carnauba palm. And the carnauba palm is a wax palm that makes waxes that are used as food additives. So okay. if you look at like a pack of gum or certain candies, they'll all have carnauba wax in them. So you've definitely eaten that before. If you've had any kind of candy recently, I, I, you just look at the label and it'll see carnauba wax in it. Okay. So that's, so that's three. Uh, let's see. There's the oil palm, Elaeus guineensis, which is a palm that we extract palm oil from. So certain cosmetics, creams, mm-hmm. things like that, they'll have palm oil. There's, of course, your parlor palm, your Camateria elegans. And I think that's parlor palm is probably the most popular indoor palm, like a houseplant palm. You can get a parlor palm like in a four inch pot and also like a huge six foot plant, right? That's right. So that's four, right? We're through four. So let's go. The fifth one, if you've ever eaten heart of palms. Love. Heart of palm is a delicious vegetable. It's harvested from the inner core and growing bud of various palm trees. You know, some of them are harvested from coconuts. Some of them are harvested from palmettos, peach palms, acai palms, other kinds of palms. So palmetto is probably a, a, a sixth palm that folks are aware of, you know, palmettos, saw palms, you know, all these different common names for these different kinds of palms. So you know more palms than you think you do. And you actually use more palm products than you think you do. That palm oil is in a lot of stuff. I feel like all my cosmetics, like my shampoos and stuff. And so what about the most common indoor palm? So we have parlor palm. I just killed a Chinese fan palm right? It's very upset with me. I feel like to me, palms, when I think of palms indoors, I think of the larger palms, like 
a parlor palm or a, the name is escaping me, but the big one with lacy, what's like the classic larger palm that people see? The Neanth Bell Palm, but that's still a, that's still a parlor palm. Fishtail palms are pretty common. There's a uh, Rapsis palms, there's uh, all kinds of other palms. Yes, the areca palm. I feel some one, one that I see like everywhere. Yep, the areca palm, which actually is what the family is named for, the areca palm or the areca beetle. Aricacea gets its name from areca, which is the Portuguese word for the beetle palm or betel palm. That's all I know about the etymology of the word. That's the name. <laughs> That's um, okay. Yeah. We got to get into the care anyway. The care, but also it's, I, sh- I have to say, while we're still talking about the family, there's three major like morphological groups of palms. There okay. are the, so they're classified, botanically speaking, they're either rhizomatous, they're lianus, or they're arborescent. And those are botanical terms. So rhizomatous means it has a rhizome underground, like ginger, like an underground stem, basically. So ginger is a rhizome. Irises that you grow in your yard, that's a rhizome. It's a basically a sideways underground stem. And then leaves and flowers and things pop out of the side and come above ground. So that's a rhizome. And a lot of palms, like your elegans or your parlor palm, those are rhizomatous palms. Usually you'll also hear them being referred to as clumping palms, Okay. Uh, clumping palms are rhizomatous because they have that stem underground. They can form clumps and they creep because the stem underground creeps. So that's rhizomatous palms. Then if we're still talking about shape, there's lianus palms. They call them climbing palms because a liana botanically is a woody vine. Okay. So that's the official botanical term for a woody vine. And there are some palms that they can hold themselves up, but they lean and if they lean on something, they'll try to like kind of grow on it, but very poorly. They're, they're not very good at it. So they're called leaning palms there or lianus palms because a liana is a woody, sta- uh, a woody vine. And then there are the arborescent palms. Arborescent means ar- like Arbor Day, they're like a tree. So those are your single stemmed classic palm tree. You know what a kindergartner draws on a little picture you put on your fridge. That's like a classic arborescent palm. One trunk, very clear and a bunch of leaves at the top. So the like palms that we know indoors, like the areca palm, the uh, parlor palm, are those rhizomatic because they have kind of several stems, I guess what they're called? I wouldn't refer to them as stems, but you're correct. They are rhizomatous. They are clumping palms. Most of the palms sold for indoors are clumping palms because it's easier. One, it's easier to propagate them. Two, it's easier to grow them and and have them recover because you have a stem with multiple growth nodes underground. So Mm -hmm. one part dies, another part can come back up. If you have a lianus or an arborescent palm, if that stalk dies, your entire palm is dead. So that's part of the reason why uh, you have arborescent palm, or sorry, uh, rhizomatous palms is the most common. Got it. Oh, majesty palm was the other palm that I was thinking about that I feel like a lot of people see indoors. Yes, yes, definitely. So let's zoom out for a minute before we dive into how to care for palms indoors. Where do we find these babies outdoors and what conditions do they thrive in? I'd like to take you on a journey all around the world. Okay. Um, I want to talk first. Let me grab my passport. (laughs) Your passport, your regular passport, your vaccine passport, all of your passports, all the passports. But I'm going to take you first on a journey around the world. And we're going to talk about where palms come from. We're going to talk a little bit more about the different groups of palms, uses of palms, ethnobotanical uses of palms, how people have used them. Ethnobotany is how people and plants, you know, they they use plants for useful things. And then we'll come back to the cares. If you listen to this podcast, you're likely a bit nerdy, a little bit of a deep diver with a passion to learn and grow with information that can be meaningful for your life. If this is you, plant friend, I suggest checking out another amazingly informative podcast. It's called Something You Should Know with Mike Carruthers. Every episode of Something You Should Know delivers fascinating information you can use in your life and help you understand the world better. Every episode, Mike talks with leading experts on topics that really affect us, like why you should embrace your most embarrassing moments. What causes coincidences? Weird things that really affect your health, understanding uncertainty, or the power of strangers. 
There is such a wide range of topics and guests, and they are always fascinating, so fun to listen to, and they will leave you a little smarter than you were before because Mike goes there. He asks questions that really get to the heart of the topic, the kind of questions that you or I would want to ask. Something You Should Know is a fun and entertaining podcast. It's got thousands of five-star reviews, and when you subscribe, you'll learn something new and useful in every episode. So give it a listen. I have a feeling you're going to love it. Search for Something You Should Know where you get your podcasts, and when you see the bright yellow bulb, start listening. You can thank me later. Something You Should Know. So first off, when we're talking about the entire palm family, Aricaceae, they're distributed pretty much across the globe. There is, you know, all six habitable continents. There are seven continents, but six are habitable. All six habitable continents have palms of some sort native to them. Now, the thing about palms is that for many palm species, we don't know where their center of origin is. And part of that reason is because many of those useful palms, like coconuts, like uh, carnauba, like date palms, have been grown for thousands of years by humans since the Neolithic age, since pretty much the Stone Age, or whenever agriculture came up, and even before formal agriculture, People were just kind of like tossing date seeds around and then a tree popped up and they're like, oh my gosh, there's dates here. So nobody knows where the coconut comes from. Nobody knows where the date palm comes from. Nobody knows where many palms come from. And the thing is that because humans have been around for a while, or at least a little while, humans have taken these palms with them and they've taken the fruit with them. And, you know, as you eat the fruit, you know, you poop out the seed. And in those days, you really didn't have sanitation. You just kind of pooped in a field, and then suddenly a palm tree starts growing, you know, assuming the conditions are right. So, and they've been traded, there have been records of, even along, especially along the Silk Road, and even earlier than the Silk Road, just palm trees, dates, palm seeds, betel seeds, all across the world. So when I, whenever I'm asked the question, where do palms come from, my answer is kind of everywhere. Although there is a theory that the coconut there are two possible centers of origin for the coconut. And one center of origin is in Indonesia, like Southeast Asia somewhere. Maybe it's Thailand, maybe it's Indonesia, maybe it's uh, Malaysia. The other center of origin is somewhere in South America, somewhere in like far South America, like towards Argentina, Chile, South Brazil. So those are the two kind of areas that I'm aware of. Now, that research is preliminary. That's subject to change. I read a few papers like that, but the official answer is still we don't know. And <laughs> humans have been transporting palms for thousands of years, so we can't even calculate back. They're just literally everywhere now. That's so interesting. I guess that means that they different palms thrive in different conditions as well if they're all over the world. Or are the areas that they're in similar? For the most part, because palms are very structurally similar to one another, they're all monocots. They're all usually monopodial, not always, but usually they're monopodial, meaning they have one growth point. So that's those lianas and arborescent palms. They all don't produce true wood. If you look at a palm and it feels woody, it's not woody. One of my cool factoids I tell folks is, how do you tell the age of a palm? And then they're like, oh, cut it down and you can count the rings. And then I say, okay, cut down this palm. And then, you know, we look at videos of palms being cut down and then they look at the trunk and there are no rings. And people often go, well, why aren't there any rings in a palm tree? I thought it was wood. I thought it was a tree. Turns out that, and this is true for any tropical tree, it, the rings of a tree don't quite have much to do with what the tree is, but really the seasonality of the location. Yeah, I learned that in plant science last year. It's such an interesting fact. Yep. Plant rings or rings in trees only exist in like temperate or seasonally changing environments because you have fast growth, which is the space between the rings, and the slow growth, which are the rings themselves. Palm trees also literally don't make true wood. So they're not even capable of producing rings, even if they wanted to. Right. Even if they had seasons. Exactly. Uh, But that being said, there are regions. So most people think of palms as tropical and for the most part they are, but it blows some people's minds when I tell them, Hey, you know, there are some cold, hardy palms. There are some frost tolerant palms. When I tell people, I have a friend, he's an amazing horticulturalist lives right outside of Philadelphia. He has palm trees planted in the ground outdoors all year. They are frost tolerant palms. So you can say a palm tree grows in Philadelphia. 
Right. And <laughs> that, that's a true statement. That's so interesting. There's always an exception. I feel like the more research I do on plants, there's always an exception to the rule, right? The minute you say there, you know, it needs this level of light, this level of care. There's always Mm -hmm. some species within, you know, the genus that's going to prove you wrong. Exactly. And like a lot of these palms come from either super Southern latitudes or super high elevations. Interestingly, there's more diversification of the palm family in the Southern hemisphere than there is in the Northern hemisphere. Like there's a lot of cold, hardy palms coming out of Australia, New Zealand, as well as in South America, there's a lot of cold, hardy palms in the high mountains of the Andes. So you'll get these palms. I think one of the tallest palms in the world comes from the Kokora Valley, and that's in Colombia. And they actually are in the Guinness Book of World Records. They're in Atlas Obscura. They're all over the place. They're famous for being the the tallest palms in the world, also the tallest monocot in the world, There are these Dr. Seuss looking plants with like regular sized palm leaves, but ginormous trunks that just shoot straight up into the air. And they're constantly waving back and forth. They're like a 200 foot tall plant that's like maybe, you know, the trunk is maybe like a foot wide, maybe less. And so it's one foot by 200 feet. And then there's like the leaves, which are like maybe three or four feet long each. And it's just a wacky wild plant. And they they come from about 6,000 feet above sea level where it does get pretty chilly. And they're, you know, this particular species, I think it's Ceroxylon quinduens or, or, yeah, I think it's quinduens or quinduens. They're the tallest palm in the world. And there's actually a national park in Colombia in the Cocora Valley that's dedicated to them. And it's like a huge tourist attraction. And it's just absolutely amazing. So there's plenty of other hardy palms too. Many windmill palms are hardy. My favorite palm in the world is the Bismarck palm. And it's my favorite palm in the world because it's this beautiful, gorgeous, chalky blue foliage. And when you see it, you'll know exactly what it is. You'll say that's a Bismarck palm. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that looks like a Bismarck palm. And Bismarck palms are pretty cold hardy. They're grown in Texas. They're grown in California. They're grown in Mississippi, Nevada, all over the place. Some needle palms, some palmettos, a lot of palm, actually not some palmettos, but more palmettos are cold tolerant. Now, just because they're cold hardy or cold tolerant doesn't necessarily mean that they enjoy being in the cold. It just means that they survive the cold. So it's a difference between surviving and thriving. So in that case, yeah, they can survive your winter, but they're not going to grow as fast as if they were in tropical conditions all the time. So That's pretty much all there is to say about the hardy palms. There's some hardy palms and you can definitely grow them all the way up to zone. I think Philly is zone 7B. I think Philly is zone 7B. So you can grow them up to about 7B if you get the right palm. Now, again, not all palms are cold hardy. Most palms are not. Yeah. So, well, I was about to say, it's interesting hearing about these outdoor palms, but I want to know about the indoor palms, baby. I want to get that palm throwback to the seventies palm, you know, look going on in my house. So what about indoor palm care? So what do we need to be thinking about if we want to bring a majesty palm and a reca palm, a parlor palm indoors and not kill it? Because I feel like, you know, palms kind of have a reputation for being rather finicky indoors. So why is that? Now, Normally what I say is, oh, you know, these things aren't as finicky as you think they're, you know, it's all kind of a myth. And, you know, usually I say stuff like that to, you know, shock people. But in this case, palms actually are finicky. Yeah. Palms, palms are a little more difficult than other plants. Like when it comes to them, if there's someone who is an ultra super novice beginner, I say don't start with a palm if you're a beginner. And that's because palms are troublesome. So let's take, let's just focus on the, the, the parlor palm, Cometaria elegans, right? That's a rhizomatous clumping palm. They sell them usually as a four inch, as little seedlings. Most of the time they're propagated by seeds because palm trees make many seeds. And they're salt sensitive for one. They, they do not like a lot of salts. They don't like hard water. So right off the bat, you know, <laughs> people who live in the countryside on well water are already at a disadvantage when it comes to palms. That's why I must have killed mine. I'm in well water territory. We have a well. Which is funny because well water is good for you most of the time. Well water is good for you. Like, at, you know, back on the orchard, I would drink straight from the faucet. And even here in New York City, I drink straight from the faucet, too, because I trust our local municipality. But a lot of times, well water is good for you. And, you know, it, but it's just not really that great for uh, your palms. Your plants would like it. Your other plants would like it. But palms, 
for the most part, your indoor palms really don't like those salts and they actually damage the leaves. So if you've ever seen a palm with specifically black tips or tips that end up black or parts of the plant that turn just straight up black, that's salt damage. Oh my gosh, that's what happened to my palm. <laughs> it was fine and then it was black. I actually thought maybe it was a fungal issue that came from the nursery or something because it was fine until I noticed some black spot edges and I was like, oh, it's a humidity thing. And then I turned around and it was freaking done. It was toast. Well, here's the other thing about palms too is normally I say, oh, people are just exaggerating about humidity. Most of your house plants don't care about humidity, which is true. Unfortunately, palms are the ones that do care about humidity. So yeah. on top of caring about the salts in the water, they also care about humidity. They're also humidity sensitive. Now, here's the difference between humidity damage and salt damage. Now, they're both abiotic damage, which means they're caused by a non-living thing, which mm -hmm. therefore means that it should affect the plant evenly and symmetrically. It's We've talked about this on previous episodes. Yep. 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 Salt damage ends up being black. Humidity damage ends up being brown. Yeah. And fungal damage ends up being brown as well. Okay. Very interesting. You'll get a combo of, oh, it started off as black and now it's brown. And then there's like black in there too. Like this weird, like somebody like spun up, like they took an artist's palette of brown and black. They started mixing it together. Yeah. That's, that's kind of what the tips start looking like after a while, if you have both problems. Got it. Yeah. I've never been so rejected by a plant in my entire life. And I, you know, I don't spend a lot of money on plants. I try and do cut plant swaps. I try and do cutting swaps and I try and buy plants small and let them grow. But I bought this plant as a treat to myself and I spent maybe $40 on it, which for me is a lot to spend on a plant. And I was just so, I've never felt more rejected in my life than when this palm was just like, nope, I hate you. I hate you. I hate your house. I hate the way you're treating me. I hate your well water and I'm dead. Now. And I was like, fine, but you know what? You got to make peace with it. It's okay. It's inspired this episode for us to have this conversation. So good to know. So they are sensitive to water. You should be watering with distilled water. How, what would you suggest? Distilled or rain water. Or rain water. Those okay. both work. Yep. You know, a lot of people say, and we can refer back to, I think it's, I don't know if it's episode 103, but one of the other episodes I talk about watering. The watering episode. Yeah. Don't worry about filtered. Don't worry about, oh, it's filtered. It's purified. I'm like, those are drinking water terms. Those don't, those don't apply here. It's either distilled or it's rain. And that's it. Got it. So... Yeah, it sounds like this is a plant parent 2.0 type plant because I think that's kind of humidity. I go back and forth on humidity, but I feel like I agree with you where a lot of people say it's humidity and it's not. But I do feel like if you want to be like a next level plant parent, rate getting intentional about your humidity, raising it in like manners that actually will raise it and not yeah. just, you know, be yeah. raise it for two seconds and then yeah. evaporate. That is like a really fun way to kind of take your plant care practice to the next level. So it sounds like if you're in that stage, it could be fun to start messing with palms and figuring that out and seeing if you can handle it. Yeah. I have friends who have had like majesty palms that all have brown tips. That's definitely a humidity thing, right? That, that's definitely humidity. It could also be a fungus, especially if it's got that weird shape or weird like finish to it. You know how the tip comes to a point. Mm -hmm. And then if you go like you're looking from the tip down towards the plant if it's got kind of like a wavy sort of undulating kind of non-even line to it, then, then it's more likely a fungus because humidity right. will be a nice, even, uh, relatively straight line. Everyone must go back and listen to the watering episode with Chris because we kind of take a deep dive into humidity versus fungus issues. And Chris coaches us a lot in how it's a, a lot, oftentimes when we think that it's a humidity issue, it's actually a fungal issue and using fungicide fixes a lot of things. And I've had so many listeners reach out saying, oh my God, I listened to the episode. I used fungicide and my plant is fixed. So this, this shit works. But anyway, back to palms. Yep, so yep, yep. We're doing watering. Now for soil, do they like to be more evenly moist or do they like periods of drought? It depends on the palm you have. I found that parlor palms tend to like it. Now here's the thing. They either like it on the dry side, but to be physically cooler or to be on the moist side, but to be physically warmer. Okay. If that makes any sense. So like you can keep the soil more moist, but it should also be more warm. 
like the pot should be warm. So in the spring and summer, when your house might be warmer, you can kind of water a little bit more. That's right. Now, also keep in mind, what I'm saying is very nuanced too, because again, a palm is a thin leafed plant. Any plant that has very thin leaves Mm -hmm. goes through water very quickly. Mm -hmm. So while you do want it to dry out enough to where, you know, you don't get fungus gnats, like the soil's dry enough to where the fungus gnats are not having a good time. You want it to dry enough but not stay dry because if it's dry for too long, then you'll start getting the leaves die back. And the other thing that makes palms difficult is the fact that they're just such slow growers. They're such slow growers indoors. So if you screw up a leaf, which is very easy to do, it's just so difficult for them to grow a new leaf and replace that. Like other things like a pothos or a monstera, like you could screw up a leaf and then two weeks or a month later, you have three new leaves. Like it's Mm -hmm. fine. But with a palm, it just takes forever for them to grow one new frond. And by the time it grows the new frond, there's already something wrong with the new frond. So it's, it's definitely a plant that like you need to pay attention to and you need to be very diligent about. So speaking of paying attention, when you said, you know, they either like this or they like that. Say I have my first palm and I'm trying to figure out my watering schedule with it. What do you suggest I be looking for that are signs of it being happy and then signs of it being maybe not so happy and okay, I've got to kind of tune in to did I overwater, did I underwater and I got to tune a little bit more. So palms are, they're very negative reinforcement. So they're kind of, it's weird that they're trendy because like they don't follow the narrative of let's all be nice to one another. They really don't. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, so basically no news is good news and bad news is bad news. So yeah. (laughs) Okay. So if it's green and looks good, that's good. If it's growing new growth, you're doing something really good. Mm -hmm. If that new growth is the same color green or darker than what you have, then that's good. If it's paler, like significantly paler, then you're not giving it enough light. So what's the light? What do palms like? What in terms of light? Where should we be putting them? The parlor palm, we'll just focus on the parlor palm. The parlor palm is sold as a low light plant. Yeah. Like all low light plants, it is not a low light plant. Uh, yeah. Tomateria elegans is actually, it grows in the shade outdoors, but it still gets tickles of sunlight and it can even grow exposed to sun for about up to half a day. And it's still totally fine. It actually grows really big that way. And in Florida in the nurseries, I've seen them grown under 30% shade cloth, 50% shade cloths under direct sun. So it's direct sun, but it goes through shade cloth. So it's like a little bit muted. So I would actually put palm trees, the best palm trees I've ever seen were palm trees that were in big sunny windows, like indoors, blast them with sun, blast them with sun, no matter what it is. And you'll get that new growth because palms need a lot of solar energy in order to do that. That's, I feel like a huge myth buster because palms everywhere I look, palms are sold as low light tolerant and pet friendly. Those are like the two big things that I think everybody's talks about with palms. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you're saying that they actually can tolerate a higher light, like a Southern windowsill is kind of mind blowing. And one of our listeners, one of our Patreon supporters wrote in with a question saying, why is my palm growing so slowly? What can I do? And so maybe the answer to that is adding more light and more light will hopefully trigger more growth. More light is more growth. Absolutely. 100%. But also heat. Palms are sensitive to heat. They're one of the plants that I tell people, hey, look, palms will care if there's a cold draft. Palms will care if it's like even ambient cold. They don't even really like to be ambient cold. So If you have them by a window in the winter, this may be hard for some people. And again, this is why this is a difficult plant is because if these tropical palms get chilly, like the park palm, they will, one, they'll stop growing. And then two, they'll throw a hissy fit. And then even when conditions are good again, they'll wait before they start growing because they don't know if it's going to get cold again. And they're just waiting. They're like, oh, I don't know, it's going to get cold. So, so not only do you stop them in their tracks, but you also delay them a little extra because they have to become comfortable with the environment again before they start growing. So interesting. they're, they're temperature sensitive, definitely. And they're much more te- temperature sensitive than even ficus or any figs. Like ficus are okay with temperatures down into the 50s. Parlor palms don't like that. Tropical vibes is what they want. Very tropical. 
Thanks so much to our amazing partner, Territorial Seed Company. Plant friends, for all of you gardeners who are lit up by growing food, I know I am, did you know that if you time things right, you can extend your garden harvest way beyond the traditional spring-summer gardening season? Spring gets all the hype, but depending on where you live, you can grow food year-round. Territorial Seed Company carries a special selection of high-quality, hardy vegetable and herb seeds that are perfect to start in the summer through fall for harvest in late fall, winter, or even over winter. And these These plants include brassicas, root crops, lettuce and greens, onions, and of course, their enormous selection of garlic and a gem of the winter and something they're pretty well known for. You plant the garlic in the fall and then you harvest the following summer and nothing beats that spicy and pungent flavor of garlic right out of the garden. Both Brie from the recent animal episode we did and Melody, my new plant friend who I'm gardening with, both are prolific garlic growers and they swear by the difference in taste. So if you need high quality, hearty seeds and plants, check out Territorial Seed Company. Support them and you support the show as well. I love their whole mission to enable gardeners to be more self-sufficient, providing everything necessary to grow bountiful and healthy, great tasting, fresh from the garden food year round. So check out their amazing variety of seeds, plants, garden planners, and more at territorialseed.com and use code BLOOM10 at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Thank you to Deer Busters for sponsoring today's episode, Plant Friends. Little did I know that one of the biggest threats to a bountiful garden harvest isn't prostates, it's not fungus, it's freaking deer and rabbits and squirrels munching on my lettuce that I'm trying so hard to grow. I freaking saw a porcupine cross the road the other day. And let me tell you, it was super cute and I love the way it waddled, but it's not cute enough for me to want to share my garden harvest with it. I know a lot of members of our community struggle with managing deer and wildlife with their gardens in the growing season. And if you're one of those people, you might want to consider installing a wildlife fence, which is the easiest way to social distance deer from your plants. Deer Busters fencing kits are an amazing option to consider. So Deer Busters makes planning and installing your garden easy with their fence kits that come with all the materials necessary that you need to build the fence. And the kits are customizable by linear feet, corners, ends, gates, tensioning, and the option to actually add extra rodent barriers. And here's the kicker, plant friends. These kits require no professional installation or fancy tools. You can install the kit with just everything that comes with it. So if you're looking to set up a fence on your own and an easy all-in-one option, check out Deer Busters. Visit DeerBusters.com today to protect your plants tomorrow and use code BLOOM at checkout for 10% off. Once again, that's DeerBusters.com and use code BLOOM at checkout for 10% off. So what about fertilizing with palms? Because they have such thin leaves. Does that kind of affect how you fertilize? Yes, actually. And if you think about a palm tree, right? Let's just pause and think about where does a palm tree come from? How do I imagine a palm tree? Palm trees are always sun drenched. They're always exposed to the sun or for the most part, they're exposed to the sun. They are often growing in terrible soils. They're usually growing in not great soils. Now some don't. Yeah, like I'm thinking about like the sandy Floridian soil that my mom has with her palms. Yeah, exactly. So not great soils, which means not that many nutrients. They're blasted by sun. And if you think about it, I'm not sure how to phrase this the right. I'm not sure how to phrase this, but I'm going to try my best. If you have a resource, you're going to be terrible at using it. If you have mm-hmm. an unlimited supply of a resource, you're going to be terrible at using it. And yeah. palms have an unlimited supply of direct sun. And when I say they're terrible at using it, it doesn't mean that they're incapable of using it. It means that they have so much of it that they don't, that they'll just, they don't know what to do with it. They're just like, oh, I have so much sun that I'm going to use it in the most inefficient way possible. So that's part of the reason why even in nature, They don't grow that fast. Like they grow fast enough, but like even in nature, most plants around them grow faster than they do. Hmm. And even though they have plenty of sun to grow, they just don't use it efficiently. They don't use it efficiently at all. Mm -hmm. Um, And so how does that affect in regards to fertilizing? In terms of fertilizing, I say fertilize much less. Fertilize, use actually about orchid strength fertilizer. If you must fertilize it, like use orchid strength Mm -hmm. and, and just, really don't like I would just say maybe give it once maybe twice a year and that's about it so I would say once in the springtime maybe once at the beginning of summer a third time if you're feeling really frisky but at at a very low concentration at you know maybe half of normal houseplant strength that's so interesting because like they're not living in nutrient-rich soil really in in nature and that's the thought process there 
Exactly. Even for the ones that live in a tropical rainforest, right? It's raining so much, the rain washes away all the nutrients. So even rainforest soil is terrible soil. If you've ever watched like those National Geographic or the David Attenborough, like Secret Life. Of- oh, my favorite. They, when they cut down the rainforest, which is very sad, when they cut down the rainforest, they burn all the trees and the plant matter and work that back into the soil because otherwise there are no nutrients. It's not like they live in Pennsylvania or New Jersey and they can cut down the trees and the soil is very fertile, so they don't have to do anything to it, right? The tropical rainforest, they have to burn everything and then work it into the soil and then have, you know, cows poop in it for a little while and then they can start farming on it. So if you think about it that way, you'll realize, oh, palms really don't need that much. And I mean, on the other hand, from a growing standpoint, that makes it kind of easy because you can, you know, with big air quotes, neglect it in that sense. That's so interesting. What other things, so they tolerate, okay, so just to, before we move on to troubleshooting, just to kind of go over general palm care. They tolerate low light, but they actually can totally take high light. And they should get high light indoors. Okay. Watering can go one of two ways, but depending on the temperature, you're, it pretty much sounds like you're going to let them like kind of top, top centimeter of the soil dry out and then water again, if not air towards maybe keeping it a little on the moisture side. Yeah. The one thing I would say is definitely don't let them stay dry. Do, if they dry out, immediately give them water. Do not let them have a dry rest. Don't let them even stay for an extra day dry because okay. they do not like that. Okay. So keeping them on the moisture side, fertilizing minimally because we're thinking about where they are grown in nature. That's right. Any other troubleshooting? So we talked about humidity we talked about we talked about humidity. We talked about the water issue. Any other troubleshooting things? Like, are they prone to any particular pests? I mean, I would assume if a parlor palm that has like a million little, you know, stalks gets bugs, like that's going to be scale would be probably so hard to treat because of all the leaves. So, are they prone to anything? What happens if they get a pest infestation? How do you suggest treating? Before we hit pests, I want to really quickly hit repotting. Oh yeah. Okay. Like repotting, it's one of those things where it's kind of like taking your child to get it, to get, uh, you know, to eat their vegetables. It's they don't want to do it, but it's good for them. Like they, they don't particularly like being repotted and they hate their root mass being disturbed. Okay. But you do have to repot the ones that you get. It's like standard plant practice. You must repot everything you get. It's always sold overgrown, all that stuff. But when you do repot it, don't really loosen the soil. Don't really loosen the soil. Don't mess with the root mass. Don't really rip the roots. Just try to keep it as intact as possible. Mm-hmm. And it's actually the best thing for the palms. Also, like if you start loosening it, you'll notice for the rhizomatous ones, like they'll start falling apart. They start weeble wobbling. Yeah. Weeble wobbling and then they all fall down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so definitely, you know, you still have to repot them, but be very careful. Do not disturb the root ball. They hate that. And the other thing I've learned is do not plant them in terracotta. Oh, no. of course, because that's going to dry the plant out. It dries them out and also terracotta holds onto salts. Mm -hmm. So it's like a double whammy of no thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's a mind, that's a mind blowing for me because my plants are not happy here for a myriad of reasons in my new house in the Catskills. I haven't been as attentive as a plant parent as I normally am, but also I've just noticed a lot. They're just, even when I am caring for them and fertilizing, they're generally not as happy as they normally are. And they're all in terracotta. So I wonder if my well water, I wonder if the terracotta is affecting them negatively. That's interesting. I think for sure it is. And and normally, don't get me wrong. Normally, I'm a very big proponent of terracotta. I think it's a fabulous material. It's actually, terracotta is the most environmentally friendly material you can use because Mm -hmm. there's no waste when you throw it away. Terracotta is literally earth and you're Mm -hmm. just returning earth to earth. There's zero waste. And I can say that very confidently. Plastic you can recycle, but plastic is, what do they say? Plastic is only 60% recyclable. They can only recover 60% of whatever you recycle. And then all the, I mean, that's pretty much the two biggest ones, plastic and terracotta. But terracotta is 100% environmentally friendly. Like I can't yeah. tell that enough, but for palms, not for palms. Interesting. Yeah. So I did a lot of things wrong with this. <laughs> so there's a lot of reason why I lost this palm. Okay, cool. So repotting, and it sounds like maybe you don't have to repot, you know, you can maybe let it get a little more pot bound than you would another plant because for sure. it sounds like just repot them when you like absolutely have to. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And then what about pests? Anything we should know about pests with these puppies? 
There's a lot and you're not going to like the answer. Is it like <laughs> compost? Is it like there's no, is it just compost the plant? It's over. Don't try. What's the well, answer? Let me put it to you this way. I love plants so much that I decided to, you know, become a professor of plants mm-hmm. of botany and be at the gardens, you know, teaching yeah. and everything. Palms are the few plants that are actually banned from my household. They're not allowed to come in. I don't accept palms. We don't accept palms here. For me, mostly because like I could grow them if I really wanted to, mm-hmm. but I also have years of experience and all that stuff, but I really don't grow them because of the pest issue. It's Interesting. Be- one, they're susceptible to everything. They're thin leafed and insects love that. Mm-hmm. So you risk name a bug and they get it. Spider mites, mealy bugs, scale, thrips, aphids, all of it. They get everything. Mm. And not only that, but like nine times out of 10, they're often sold in these big, dense clumps, which, of course, mm-hmm. the pesticides can't get inside. So once they get something, you will never get rid of it. Even if mm-hmm. you treat it, you will never get rid of anything that it ever gets. And literally almost every palm I touch, I'm like, oh, look, more spider mites. And eventually over time, the spider. Now, there are some people who get very lucky. There are some people who get very lucky in their palms, don't have spider mites. And I say you're doing something right. Congratulations. But mm-hmm. For me, they always get spider mites and the spider mites end up taking the plant. And I say, you know what? I don't need this kind of abuse in my life anymore. (laughs) Well, you know what? I think that's a very important aspect of plant parenthood that people grow into and they realize what works for them and what doesn't. And exactly. I just went through that. I I talked on my podcast for six months about how obsessed I was with alocasia and how excited I was to bring them into my collection. And then I started bringing them home and my current home environment does not work for alocasia. So I have a few under glass that are doing okay. But part of me too, just as a plant parent is starting to realize, you know what, at this juncture of my life, I think I need to just, for the most part, appreciate alocasia on Instagram and in my other friends' collections until I can get an Ikea grow house set up and have it, you know, in ideal conditions that it needs to be in. And kudos to you if you've had palms and realize that they're not for you, you know, and there are going to be some people probably that I'm sure love palms and love managing the humidity and love, you know, and go all of for it it. As well, which makes sense too. I, I think that's actually the, like the richer stuff, you know, I think that's the most interesting th- stuff is like not only collecting plants, but like figuring out what works for you and what doesn't and like what actually makes you happy and what makes you stressed, you know? Right, exactly. And really, when it boils down to it at the end of the day, and I'm sure you've hit this many times, it's, you know, each plant has its range of requirements. Mm -hmm. And some plants have a wider range, they're willing to accept more things. And other plants have a more narrow range. Yeah. And then there's the range that your home provides, whatever that may be, maybe your home is more moist, maybe it's more dry, maybe it's more whatever. It's about lining up the range yeah. that your home provides yeah, with yeah, whatever yeah. the range your plant has. And totally. If, if it's a miss, it's a miss. If it's just on the edge, you might be able to push the ranges so that they overlap and make it happy. But, you know, it, like you said, for me, I've learned there are plants that I should grow and there are plants that I should not grow. And for me, palms are not one of them. I just can't deal with something I can't get rid of all the pests from. Yeah. That's fair. And you have a lot of plants and you also have a lot of expensive, fancy orchids that you do not want getting pests. So you have to be diligent about that as well. First off, they're not that expensive. Okay. Or rare. (laughs) Sorry, not expensive. You have a lot of, you have an unbelievable collection of rare orchids. I mean, come on now. I I guess you could say that. I I just, I don't like using the word rare. Other people use the word rare. There are less commonly found things. Yes. But collectible, we can say collectible. Collectible. We can say collectible. I have a lot of collectible orchids. Yeah. Um, But yeah, it's a risk thing. It's, and and not only that, but I found in my years of working with plants and field greenhouses everywhere, certain plants just attract certain insects Mm -hmm. like citrus attracts spider mites. Palms attract spider mites. The weird thing about those two plants is that for the most part, if they become infested, weirdly enough, the spider mites tend to only stay on those two plants. Mm -hmm. They they have the potential to spread elsewhere. Most of the times they don't, but there are some, there are plants that they definitely have an affinity towards like alocasias. They will totally destroy your alocasias. They'll totally Mm -hmm. destroy your palms. They'll totally destroy your citrus, but something like 
certain ferns, they'll stay away from They're like, ah, this fern's not that yummy. I don't like it. Mm -hmm. And then it's this fern is thin leafed. It is floofy. It is everything a spider mite should want and they don't even attack it. So there's weird bug behaviors too, but like I I digress. I'm going off on a tangent. I love it. I just got one of those fancy lenses that has the little light on it. So when you open it, it has like a light because I'm trying to get a little bit better with understanding pests because I have been rather fortunate that they haven't been a huge issue in my collection, but when they've taken, they've taken me down when they've taken me down. So I, I'm, that's a goal of mine in 20 for the rest of 2021. What about propagation? So it sounds like if say I have a palm and it's gotten too big, can I just, if it's rhizomatic, can I just do divisions? It's not yes. like you can, you can't propagate like a, a palm leaf. It sounds like, so it's either seeds no. or divisions. It's either seeds or divisions, and chances are your palm probably won't flower indoors. So it's just divisions if you have a clumper. But if you have a single trunk palm, you're not going to propagate that. Well, let's talk about that because I've seen a few people with the whole coconut <clears throat> thing, like buying a coconut that has sprouted and has a shoot. Right. So can people really grow those indoors? And have you seen success with that? Because I guess that's a seed, right? So that's how that's growing. Coconut? It looks really fun. I mean, it looks really cool. Oh, don't get me wrong. Those things are a bucket of fun. Like Mm -hmm. I love them. And I even had one at one point, but that was in my phase of it. This one won't get spider mites. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So growing the coconut is absolutely fun. That's one of those things that I encourage like everyone to at least try. It's like kind of a gimmick, but it's also like real. Mm -hmm. So is it a coconut? hundred percent. Yes. If it theoretically reaches maturity, will it make coconuts? Yes. Will it ever reach maturity in your home? No. Kind of similar to an avocado seedling. Avocado, you could theoretically get mature in a sunroom. It just needs to be a little taller. You could get an avocado to make avocados indoors, just like you can get citrus to make citrus indoors. There are dwarf bananas you can make indoors. There's actually quite a bit of tropical fruit you can grow indoors. Star fruit, pineapple. If you have the space and the light, the key is the space and the light. So if you have the space and the light, you can do pineapples indoors, citrus, avocado, papaya, guava, cinnamon, star fruit, there's a bunch that you can grow indoors, but coconuts get too tall. They have to be too tall. Interesting. Before they start. But you could get it pretty big. You get it big. Oh, absolutely. As long as you have the sun for it. Exactly. Yep. I think that's so fun. I kind of want to, I mean, we're moving again and then we're probably going to move again. We're like super nomadic right now, but once I have a sunny entry hallway, I think that could be super fun um, to do, you know, once I get a little bit of sun. I want to hit you with a few listener questions before we wrap up. Sure. Danny wants to know, how can you effectively control a palm's growth if it's a species that grows tall? That is a really good question. And for many plants, you can kind of coerce them to grow a certain way based on manipulating their conditions. Like, for example, I purposely keep my my, my dendrobium, certain dendrobium to be a smaller size by very carefully restricting water during growth Okay. Um, in, in a very specific way. That's just one way that you could do it. As far as palms go, though, they're ultra specified in terms of their evolution, meaning that they have evolved to be very specifically one thing. Mm-hmm. And that one thing is very successful. They're pantropical. They're everywhere. But in terms of like growth, they have a blueprint they follow the, br- the blueprint. They do not deviate from the blueprint. So mm-hmm. in terms of restricting their, their growth, you can't really do that without harming the plant on palm. So the only thing you could do is just reduce the light so that it grows much more slowly. Uh-huh, so while yeah. you can't reduce the height that it eventually grows to, you can restrict the amount of light so that you can either arrest the growth or just have it grow super slowly. And, and that's how you Interesting. Now, Kathy asked how to avoid pests in majesty palms. So we, we kind of touched on the fact that most palms mm-hmm. are going to get pests. If a palm get gets a pest, what is your best suggestion? Because you said, because they're so clumpy at the bottom, a pesticide is going to be hard. So say someone ha- is struggling with that, like what would be mm-hmm. their best effort that you would suggest? So this is where suburban and rural homes or homes without doors actually um, become very valuable. Okay. And if you have a palm and it gets insects, chuck it outside, assuming the weather is good, chuck it outside, take your hose, blast the bleep out of it. Just blast yeah. it down with water away from the house so that they don't crawl back in, blast. And then 
I go an extra step further because I'm, you know, crazy. I would put sprinkle like predatory mites or predatory like wasps or whatever mm-hmm. all around the yard. And of course, me being me, I would also plant flowers so they stay by. And, right. You know, I, I would yardscape a little too to make sure that the good bugs stay by mm-hmm. and that they eat all the spider mites that I'm blasting off this pulp. So step one, take it outside use a hose, full nozzle, blast everything. And when you're blasting, you want to aim the the force of the water slightly upwards because you want it to go under the leaves and up and Mm -hmm. kind of fling them out because they're going to cling to the bottom of the leaf very hard. They're going to cling to the top too, but the bottom even harder. And so you need to get that jet of water. And especially in the base, you just go kind of horizontally. Plants grow vertically. You come in in horizontally. You want to get everything through and out of wherever they can hide. Again, like I always say, if you want to kill the bugs, you got to think like a bug. Where would bugs hide? Literally anywhere you can't get to. So that's where they are. So blast it with water. Follow up with some kind of insecticide. Now, I know a bunch of people are super into neem doesn't work for really things like this. I would use either a horticulture oil or an insecticidal soap, both of which are fine. And there are ones that are approved for organic gardening if you're into that. Um, yeah, Espoma has one that I use, a pest, pest yeah. spray that's all organic. Yep. Espoma is great. Yep. Yep. You can use that. And you just spray it down top to bottom and you're outdoors. So you can get kind of wild with mm-hmm. it. Um, just drippy. don't get any. Um, so it gets nice and drippy, very drippy yeah. doused like OMG. It just came out of the pool and it's the palm. Hot girl, hot palm summer. Hot palm <laughs> summer. Yes. yes. Love that. Love that for us. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Hot That's awesome. Palm. Hot palm summer. I'm, I'm, I'm going to use that. So, use that. okay, cool. So, you know, spray it down. But yeah, for more pest control suggestions, I did a great interview with Summer Rain Oaks a while back. Mm-hmm. You can scroll down the podcast feed and she talks about those predatory wasps and bugs that you mentioned. So if listeners are super interested in diving deeper, you can check that episode out and it will be in the show notes. And that's it for listener questions. So did you want to hit us with a couple fast facts, fast palm facts? Yeah, absolutely. I So palms, interestingly enough, since we come here for the science, did you know that there are certain species of palm that can change sex? No, I did not know that. Yes. A lot of palms are dioecious or evolutionarily they're on their way to being dioecious. And that's a botanical term that means one plant is male, one plant is female. There are still many hermaphroditic palms. And, you know, for the listeners who haven't listened to too much of my too many of my previous podcasts, I, I, I like to make the point that most of your flowering plants are hermaphrodites. So uh-huh. I, I always think of it as weird when people name their plants like a gender. Na- I'm just like, I don't know. I, 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 not even gender neutral. I'm just like, I mean, maybe it's just me. I don't name things. I just call them what they are. Like mm-hmm. book is book, plant is plant, palm <laughs> is palm. I love lamp from Anchorman. <laughs> exactly. I love lamp. I love palm. That's my sort of the way I approach the world. Uh-huh. So, it's always weird to me when people engender plants and they're like, she likes being misted. She doesn't want to be repotted. I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, it's really an it or a they right. or something. It's neither he nor she, but who cares? It's a plant. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. I've named some of my plants. Most of them I don't, but I have a few special ones that I have named. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, I, I have one that I kind of refer to as there's Fernie and then there's Stagu, the staghorn fern, but that's just me being dumb. Stagu, I like Stagu. that. That's so cute. That <laughs> limey, my lime tree. It's neither of us are exactly. extremely, neither of us are extremely creative. <laughs> <laughs> Fernie and Limey. Yeah, we yep. really worked hard on those names. That took me all night. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, any other fun, fun palm facts as we wrap up? They can change sex. They, many of them are used for food. In fact, the oil palm actually produces more oil per square meter or something like that than any other oil producing thing. Palms have been used since time immemorable to humans for literally everything. Every part of the plant is used on different species of palms. There are, by the way, thorny palms. There are palms that have spines, thorns, and they're not very fun. They're not grown very often for obvious reasons because their thorns or spines or prickles or whatever they have are very nasty. Mm. They're very nasty. and uh, But they do exist and they're not fun to work with. What would you recommend for an indoor palm if someone wanted to try it? Obviously, we've talked about the parlor palm a lot. Yep. Which I think is the most readily available that people could probably find at nursery store nurseries. 
I think I'm of the opinion where that palm is actually an okay palm to start with. It's everywhere. It's not very expensive. So if you kill it, it's, you know, not that mm-hmm. hard on your wallet or your budget. It's a relatively good plant. If you can get it within the narrow range that it likes, it's actually mm-hmm. a very rewarding plant. Now, there are people who they just get it right. They, they get the yeah. plant right and then it grows very nicely for them. And kudos to them. If you can get it right, you just have to discover which conditions there are. But yeah, definitely start with the Nianth Bell Palm or the Parlor Palm. I think they're both Comedoria elegans. The classic palm that's sold everywhere indoors in stores at most places. And the cool thing about that, I guess, too, is you can get it super teensy or you can get it super big. Because I feel like people are drawn to palms a lot because they're large. And I feel like they're billed as a low light plant. So they're so it's like the good option for a corner, you know, like yeah. a big statement plant. So I guess you could get a larger parlor palm as well. Yeah, I always recommend, especially for like people who are newer. Now, this is going to sound weird, but for people who are newer, I say get a larger plant. Start with a larger plant, leave the smaller plants to people who are more experienced because Mm. with those tiny one inch parlor palms, like they sell like the one inch or the two Mm -hmm. inch plugs of those palms, you miss one watering. Yeah. More watering with those tiny pots. That's very true. We just did an episode on that. Yep. Tiny plants have very different care requirements. Shockingly. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. 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 Well, this has been so fun. I... Don't know if I feel super inspired to go get another palm after our conversation, (laughs) but I do feel like I really troubleshot the palm that I killed, which is Mm -hmm. super helpful. And I think if there are any listeners in the community who have successfully cared for palms, we want to hear about it on the Instagram post for this episode. And speaking of Instagram, Chris, you're Botanic Tonic on Instagram, but you're the plant doctor there. You have so many awesome resources on your website. So where can everyone come find you? Yeah. So I actually have a few avenues that people can find me. They can find me as botanic tonic on Instagram. They can also find me as NYC plant doctor on Instagram. And I also have a website where I have a lot of plant care information and products I recommend, you know, how to repot, how to do this, how to do that pesticides. I recommend fertilizers. I recommend light equipment that I recommend and care information for different kinds of plants I have on my website, nycplantdoctor.com. And on nycplantdoctor.com, I have, you know, I'm focusing more so on care sheets right now, but there are some how-to articles on there and it's always a work in progress. So I, it, so just bear with me as I get more stuff on. By the time this airs, I will have a how to care for palms article. So Perfect. if you really love this episode, then you can definitely check out that on nyc cplantdoctor.com. We'll and link it in the show notes too. Awesome. And I'll have a lot more information coming out there, including local NYC consultations. I do that sometimes. So that's going to be in there too. All my contact information is in there. You can email me there and uh, yeah, check it out. Perfect. Well, we'll definitely have you back. I think you're going to come back and visit every so often for more of these family 101 episodes because they're so requested and our community loves you so much. So go check Chris out. All of his stuff is linked in our show notes as per usual and on Instagram. We didn't even talk about this, but Chris is just an amazing orchid fanatic and Botanic Tonic has so many beautiful orchids to go check out. And Chris, it's been so nice talking to you again and go enjoy those gorgeous, huge ass windows in your and I can't wait to come see them in person sometime soon. I would love to have you over. And I, you know, I can't wait until we can all meet each other in person again. And I'm so excited to see you. I'm just, I can't wait to hug you again. I just, me too. Oh my God. Me too. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye. Okay, plant friends. So happy to have Chris back on the show. Thank you so much, Chris, for all of that amazing information. It was interesting to learn about kind of the outdoor history as well as the indoor history of palms. I had no idea how palms like influence our lives and the products that we eat and the products that we use rather intensely. I I didn't know that before this episode. So thank you, Chris. All of his links are in the show notes. So make sure you're following him on Instagram. You're subscribed to his newsletter. He's just got so much information to share. He's such a fun guy. And if you're interested in community and supporting the show and maybe making some new plant friends, I highly suggest you checking out bloomandgrowradio.com slash community and joining our new community platform. It is so much fun and we've got so many fun ideas for it. The launch is coming, so make sure you've reserved your spot to take advantage of some fun launch things that we're going to be doing in the coming month. 
And if you are a palm whisperer, if you have palms that work for you, hop over to my Instagram and the post associated with this episode and let me know in the comment section what palms you like, what palms help you, all that good stuff. I want to know like what's working for you and maybe learn from you to see if I can maybe try a different palm again and, and maybe not have it turn black and shrivel up the way this last one did. But like Chris and I kind of dove deep in that conversation. It's all about figuring out the plants that work for you and releasing the plants that don't. So on that note, my plant friends, I hope you're nurturing collections of plants that bring you joy and not stress and that they're all grown for you right now and you yourself are growing alongside them. And until next time, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section and leave us a review? It would be tremendously helpful for the show. So thanks in advance. If you're looking for more planty content or ways to help and support the show or engage with our community, we've got a ton of options for you. So first, there's the free Bloom and Grow Plant Parent Personality Test. It is a super fun three-minute test that I made for you that pairs you with your plant parent personality profile, where you'll learn your planty strengths and weaknesses and get a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley tailored just for you. The test lives at Bloom and and growradio.com slash personality. And you have to let me know what your results are on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram at Bloom and Grow Radio. If you're interested in supporting Bloom and Grow Radio, consider becoming a Patreon plant friend of the show. Patreon plant friends are members of the community who support the show monetarily on a monthly basis for as little as $4 a month. And these magical humans help support the show and bring our content to as many planty eyes and ears as possible. Once you join, you'll also get the secret password to our Facebook group, which I like to call the plantiest corner of the internet. We have a lot of fun over there. You can become a Patreon plant friend at patreon.com slash bloom and grow radio. And of course, you can also just join our newsletter that I like to call the Garden Club. When you join our Garden Club, you'll receive a free download of the exclusive Molly Mansfield Keep Blooming print, which is so adorable. And I'll slide into your inboxes usually only around twice a month with plant care tips, recent episodes, and announcements. You can join at bloomandgrowradio.com slash community. And for anything else, plant friends, I'm here for you. So feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. Thanks again for listening. It is my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing. plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will 
will pop up. So you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free plant parent personality test because plant friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible. So I made this cutie little plant parent personality quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. <music> 